Rock Hopper here and I'm back at the Mojave Center with Ian and Nicolette and we're going to see what has happened in the year since I was last here. Let's find out how much further these Super Adobe Earthbag homes have progressed since I was last here and let's hear about the cost of building them. We make these uh, Earthbag buildings together. Um, we didn't come up with this style architecture, but it is uh, from a famous architect, Nader Khalili. And uh, it's just one of the showpieces that we demonstrate here at the Mojave Center. Um, we are a nonprofit education center that focuses on affordable housing and earthen buildings in particular. Uh, so we just want to do a quick tour for you all while uh, our main man, Rock Hopper, is out here. <laughs> and uh, show you a couple of these student domes that we have here and the progression of... Um, from the beginning to kind of the end look of what they're like. So I think last time when Rock Hopper was here, these domes were just built, meaning they didn't have any of the plasters or anything on them. And so this is a really good actually progression to see. Um, first we start with the cob plaster, or it's we also call it a base plaster. It's basically just clay, sand, and straw. And then you can see we've started the next coat of plaster, which is our lime cement, or it's like a cheaper stucco in a way. So this one's not quite finished here. This one over here has the final stucco finish and the flower one there. And then we finally finish it with a um, elastomeric paint that has a low, what is it, VO? VOCs, yeah. VOC. Volatile organic compound. Um, the paint swatches over there are just us testing some stucco finishes there. We are going to switch and just do the, the paint finish on that. Um, but yeah, if this is a really cost-effective way to finish the exterior of a home, um, or especially this size. I mean, these the clay, sand, and straw plaster is really, really it's cheap. I don't even know how much it is. Cheap. Cheap. Under 200 bucks, if that. Um, and then, yeah, the, the cement, and really it's just, it takes four bags of cement. If Yeah, no, not even. Two bags of cement, two bags of lime, and a ton of sand to finish this one. So... $90 for the cement coat, uh, which is your cheap stucco, and then, yeah. One of the new other things, too, is some of the domes have doors and windows on them. Uh, they are custom-built doors, so why don't we go look at those and see how those are done. Awesome. Let's go take a look. Okay, first off, tell us a little bit about the cost of the bags, and then how much does it cost to build this entire little dome structure right here? Okay, well, this little dome right here is only an 8-foot dome. So it's quite like an emergency style shelter dome. So it goes up fairly fast with a few hands and um, it doesn't really cost too much. So the bags, depending on where you buy them from and the size that you're looking at, like the width of them, um, this one in particular, the bags alone, we spent about $100 just in the polypropylene woven bags. Um, so that's pretty cheap. It's about 14 cents for every foot. That does vary on where you buy them from, though, and there's a bunch of different distributors around the U.S. So, um. And we used about 700 feet of bag when building this. And then it goes up in about six days of building time, and then there's about three weeks of finished work. So to give you a timeline, you can have an eight-foot dome in about a month with, like, it's pretty, pretty long days because there's lots of coats of plaster, there's a lot of drying time, but the actual building is pretty quickly. It goes up pretty quickly. Yeah. And then the, the doors and the windows is where it gets a little bit more. Depends on the aesthetic that you're going for, exactly. too. Like, we're trying to make them more nice and uh, last for a really long time, but people make these and they just put mud on the outside and just repair the mud. So it depends on what you're trying to go for. Um, if we step inside, this is kind of the look that we're going for with the interiors. And this one, just we lock someone in there, but I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's go on in and have a look. And so then that's where we do more of these clay plasters on the inside. Okay, so you got a nice little bed here. Yeah. And you've got windows here and over here. And let's have a look up. This one does not have a skylight, but some of them do. Yeah. Come here, look at the light here. And there is some turn lighting. On and off a little bit. <laughs> have electricity. Yeah, and a nice little outlet to uh, yep. do some stuff right there. This doesn't There's look very pretty. This, is a, this was a patchwork, but. That's okay. And so, once again, these are like final plasters, but it still needs a whole nother coat. And the, we use these to help people practice. And so, when they're here and they're working and they're learning, 
they'll practice a lot of these final clay plasters and this is just the first coat so that's why you see some kind of fractures in it mm -hmm. um, but F, it's really cheap to make it just we're using native clay with this and some pretty cheap sand some lightweight sand and um, some toilet paper to do these plasters but overall you know you don't have to do this level of like aesthetic mm -hmm. you can make them easier but we want people to be comfortable when they're inside here and most of the people that do stay inside here they do say it's small but in these type of elements out here it's really nice to just be able to retreat to this kind of cavern slash bomb shelter thing to <laughs> escape the the wind and all the crazy elements that can come um, from the desert so uh, it works out pretty well to kind of wrap up the price cost analysis of it um, these the way that we build them with the price of the windows the doors the wood the plasters everything it costs us about two thousand dollars to finish a build this size um, so you can take that however nice you want it or however not nice you know so which it seems like that's a lot though it's the cost of cement yeah, so Never. that's all depends on your level of, so the bags are cheap, but then whatever native soil you're working with, you may need to add X amount of like stabilization to it. And so out here in the desert, this particular part of the Mojave doesn't have any um, clay in it, in the native soil, so it doesn't like bind together very well to make a nice block. So then we have to either put lime or cement into the bags at a small percentage to give that extra binding ability for the block, otherwise it'll just kind of turn back into this poofy, silty, sandy kind of soil. And so the, the cement isn't much, it's only 10% per mix, so, but it does add up. I can't remember how many bags it was total. There was, was 40 bags. No, it was 25, 25, 25 90 pound bags, so yeah. it can add up, but once again, that's just our, that's just here, and while we'd love to use less cement, um, it's just cost benefit analysis of chucking in clay, but then also having to filter out all the silt um, or just buying some cement and just mixing that with our native soil and that binds really well. So you can always make them more eco-friendly, but there's always a trade-off with where you're doing them at. Like how well is the soil that you're working with? Um, so those things determine that. And as well as like what we'll talk about later with permitting, which Mm -hmm. There's uh, certain requirements for permitting, which need, you need to have cement into it anyways. Right, and we'll also talk about putting in a well and the cost of that. And that varies depending on where you are in the desert as well. Yeah, and what... this, I mean, this place is probably the cheapest place in the West to get a well. One of them. I mean, don't quote me on that, but <laughs> it's like one of the cheaper places out here that I've heard of. All right, well, let's go look at some more yeah, let's go look structures. So here's another student housing um, for when people come to take workshops with us. They can stay in a dome like this. Let's so go have a look. All right, now this is uh, pretty similar. We've got the lighting right there. You've got the windows here. And uh, you've got your bed there. So very, very similar in style. And I don't know, how many, how many square feet would you say this is? 50? Yeah. Okay, so like an ultra tiny home. Yeah, enough to like spin around and dance without a bed in there. <laughs> or like sit down and meditate or... Really what they're used for is for our students to have a place to come stay comfortably in the desert because sometimes it's really hot, sometimes it's really windy, sometimes it's snowing, sometimes it's raining, and so just a nice place where they're not camping out in the desert and hide away from the elements. And then we have a community kitchen and space for them to use. So it's just a sleeping quarters. And it's a good demonstration site that's easily... We, we build these at our workshops, right? So it goes up in a workshop, they get to stay in one. It's a whole, the whole experience, so. Awesome, <laughs> all right. Well, let's go have a look at some more things here. Uh, so this is uh, just a shower. So this is a six foot diameter one. So now you're looking at a smaller square footage, um, just maybe probably the same amount of bag length, um, but now it's just a little bit taller. So there's a different technique to raise them up. Um, even though the diameter of the actual dome is smaller. So uh, if you come check this one out, we'll take a little look on the inside. Uh, this is where you can start to incorporate some lime plasters into it to uh, have some waterproofing on the inside, uh, some tile work so that and you can tell that it's smaller than the other ones that we were just in, but it's definitely 
maybe uh, it's about the same size height, mm -hmm. but uh, we had to raise this one up a lot because the diameter is really small. So to make it actually, um, you're able to walk into it comfortably and take a shower, you, um, you need to make them a little bit taller. So this kind of has like a rough lime polished plaster um, and this makes it more waterproof so that when you're showering showering it doesn't um, doesn't like ruin any of the mud plasters behind it so it just starts with this basic kind of mud plaster and then there's a lime a lime base plaster right there with then a lime uh, polish on top of that so uh, that's where you can get some color that's where it comes out a little bit smooth and then it's finished with some soap um, Originally we kind of wanted this cracking idea, but now we're going to change it up and do a different type in here later on. But this makes it smooth and waterproof. This is the, our well that we put out here. Um, we didn't actually dig it, but uh, our friend did. And we need to dig. Yeah, <laughs> and so the water level, I think we went down to 200 or 320 is the total depth, and then the water that we sucking most of it out of is around 280. There is some water before that, but the main gravel bed that had a, a lot of water was at 280. So it is kind of far down there, and um, there's always something to be said about taking water out of an arid climate and out of the ground. Um, but I think there's also a lot of examples, like in our local cities and communities that use a lot of groundwater, and they, they can sometimes squander it, maybe, either on golf courses or just random kind of non-native plants and while we do have a well and uh, we are going to capture more and more rainwater whenever it does rain here and filter all that rainwater into basins so that we can capture it, save it in mulch and plant native plants. Uh, we do need some extra irrigation to get those trees and those native plants started and so that's why we decided to go ahead with a well um, just so that we can get those trees and those things started and they can live for two years and then hopefully after that since they're selected specifically for this climate they won't need a lot of additional irrigation and that will allow us to use uh, less of this well water as well over with that shower that we saw earlier is anytime that we do use the water we're going to go ahead and recycle it either with gray water and it's feeding in the instance of that shower it's feeding some desert willows and a mesquite over there so anytime ever any of us take a shower here we're also irrigating those native plants, so we're trying to make that circle more more closed and not just using the water once and then kind of getting rid of it. So, um, Once again, we are in the desert. It's one of the most arid places in the Western Hemisphere, um, but it is. Uh, we're going to do our best to try to demonstrate how to properly use groundwater in a really arid climate. That's great because the Mojave Desert is the most arid desert in North America. Yep. Yeah. And so it varies in terms of how much rain it gets here. Last summer we did have kind of a monsoon effect, so there was more rain here in the summertime. Yeah. And we have had just a good rain, a couple inch rainstorm just uh, a week or so ago. So we do get water out here. And uh, kind of the idea behind and the planting that we'll do is once again it'll be below the ground deep mulch a foot to two feet of mulch and so that anytime that we do irrigate those trees that are starting the none of that water will ever evaporate off of the ground it'll all be stored within the kind of living sponge of the soil that we're going to end up creating so um so we'll just quickly talk about some permitting things we're not um we're not building inspectors so it varies from whatever county you're in and whatever state you're in um, if this is even a good choice for you mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, if your county is going to allow it so uh, with these they don't have a concrete foundation so at least in the state of California you can build something that's temporary that doesn't have a concrete foundation um, and that is below 120 square feet so if you had a house somewhere in California and you wanted to build one of these small ones that I believe technically you can build something like this in your backyard because it doesn't have an actual concrete foundation in it. It's mm -hmm. just technically the bags that are below ground that act as a foundation, but they're not um, stuck to any kind of concrete footing, if that makes sense. So um, while they don't look very temporary, I think it would still be considered a temporary structure because of that aspect of not having a concrete foundation. 
Um, so if you want to do something bigger, then um, Cal Earth has architectural plans that you can buy that have been stamped by engineers. So if you're looking for a larger size dome, then you can go ahead and buy one from them at a certain price. Uh, you can also work with some structural engineers. Uh, often people aren't very, or the class of people of structural engineers that work in the U.S. don't really have that much familiarity with these types of structures, but we know a couple, and um, we can definitely uh, share that information. Um, so if you wanted to engineer a dome that's a lot bigger and you had a bigger idea, then you just have to work with one of these engineers that knows these uh, these domes well, and then they can uh, sign something off for you, and you can build this as a primary residence in, in the state of California as well as some some other states, I'm sure. So it once again depends on that that engineering stamp, unless you're doing something that's 120 square feet or less. So uh, that's important to remember. Um, but once again, it, it's county by county. Some counties don't even have building codes, so that's something to consider as well, too. Um, but overall, uh, the startup cost would be uh, you need to find an architect to maybe draw you up some drawings, or if you're able to do that using Revit or some other SketchUp thing and have a general idea on what you're trying to build, then you can start there. Uh, afterwards, you would submit those plans to a structural engineer. They would do all the calculations that are needed, and then they would uh, stamp that off, and then you could submit that to your building department. So I think that's how most eccentric, strange houses are built around the U.S. They have to have some sort of uh, engineering stamp. Unfortunately, compared to straw bale and uh, I believe Cobb uh, buildings, they have more of their own section within the California Building Code so that you can use that code, and specifically straw bale, to go ahead and build a house because it has its own appendix in the building code. And as of now, these are in the International Code Council for a stabilized uh, earth wall, uh, compressed earth wall, um, using these bags. And there's some techniques that are explained and tests done by Keller that um, show that the type of masonry work that this is classified as uh, is suitable as a building material. Now, if it goes into different shapes and actually used for like a house and a wall, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on that. So, our for sure method is just working with the structural engineer, especially if you're going to build something very, uh, fairly large. So, if somebody wanted to build a sizable earth home, say, super adobe earth bag home, uh -huh. what do you think ballpark figure would be the permitting fee? Uh, well, so the engineer can. Uh, range from three thousand to six thousand dollars just to get his stamp, his or her stamp. That's what we were their quoted stamp. by one of one of ours. So yeah, that's what and we're comparing it to. Then there's obviously whatever the licensing fee is once you apply for that permit. If you have to have an architect draw up some plans for you, then that's going to be an additional cost as well too. Uh, Nicolette was uh, she studied ar architecture, so she was able to draw up some plans, and that's how we submitted those to the engineer. Um, and after that, um, once again, we're going back to these bags not really costing very much. It's 14 cents a foot, so the structure itself doesn't really cost very much. Um, but those startup fees are, yeah, they can range from maybe six to eight thousand dollars, or three to eight thousand dollars, depending on how big and how elaborate it is that you're going to build. Maybe county dependent. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good to know. So, you know, people want to know all the very People want to know all the various factors that go into this, everything that's involved from permitting fees, from hiring an architect and what the cost might be for that, yeah. to the actual cost of the structure itself, uh -huh. a well, uh, what it might cost to run plumbing and electric. Yeah. And so maybe what we should, we should do is go have a look at the larger dome and you know from the outside. And you can talk a little bit about that and the costs involved so far. Okay. This dome's changed a lot since I last filmed it and showed it to you. It was just earth bags before, but now you can see the finish. And it's looking pretty good and, and really getting close to being a finished product. So behind us we have our what we call the Oasis Dome. You can see it's sunken down into this 
Um, this is all the material in this pit here is the material that was used to build the structure, and so that's why it's sunken. We're going to eventually plant a bunch of plants around here, and this is what we're calling our oasis dome. It's um, about 350 square feet, um, and then I know everyone's really curious about like what does this thing cost to build, and it's actually very, very affordable. Um, right now we're about $5,200 invested into the materials alone, and then we're, it's about right around $12,000 with finished work, permitting, everything all said and done. Um, that's what we're estimating is the final cost. We're not there yet, um, but that's what we're estimating here. Um, I do apologize for all of the, the trenching and things like that. We're still working on getting all of our plumbing lines um, set up and gas lines, and so it's kind of, it's always a work in progress. But we do have the exterior complete. Um, this is with all the plasters and um, it has the final stucco and the paint on there, uh, which is really beautiful. And yeah, um, 320 square feet, right around $12,000. And what's really beautiful about this size of a home is it is multi-generational, right? It's not just a tiny home that's going to be used for one lifetime. Like these buildings, we're hoping, can be passed down to our children or our children's children if they choose to live out here or... You know, they will be standing for a very long time. We are basically remaking these rock homes that live in the desert and don't really weather as much as, you know, traditional houses do. Um, but yeah, there you have it. <laughs> so, theoretically anyway, these, with just minimal maintenance, could last hundreds of years. Yeah, they could. Um, Calorth has only been around. Calorth was the first builder of these types of buildings. They only started in the 90s, late 80s, if I remember. So they're still testing how long those domes are standing, right? There hasn't been a, a dome longer than 30 years. Um, and so, but they do testing. They've done a ton of testing on testing their strength. And so, yes, theoretically, they should last hundreds of years because they're, again, remaking rock homes. Um, so, yeah. Well, that, that's cool because this this could be a really awesome investment for some people if they want to get into this type of building. Yeah, and um, to mention again what Cal Earth has done with the testing, they've also tested the seismic activity and the um, the fire resistance. They are flame retardant. You can't light this thing on fire. I mean, the door will light on fire because it's wood, but nothing else inside will because it's, it's dirt, right? Dirt doesn't burn. Um, and then as far as seismic activity, the way that they're structurally built with the Velcro plates in between, they basically shimmy on the ground like a cup wood upside down on a table. Um, so it's pretty cool that being in California, you can have these fireproof and somewhat seismic proof domes. Dome homes. <laughs> that is cool, because that would come in really handy out here in the land of shake and bake. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So that's the first step, right? We go from the bags and we cover it with the, uh, the cob plaster there to begin filling in all the cracks. And then we come over here to the left to the smoother finish here. And then if you keep panning inside the room, this is what the final coat looks like. You just be careful because this floor is still really wet. Um, we just laid all this. So that's what the final coat of that room will look like. And then you can pan up to the skylight there. And this one does have a skylight. And electricity. And electricity. So all the rooms inside this dome will eventually look like that. So Nicolette, show me how these windows work right here. So these are custom made lancet arch windows. So we make them, the, we cut the glass, we cut the plywood, everything like that. This is our, the best design we've come up with so far. Um, it's on a, it has a latch here and then it just folds inward here to get the airflow in. Um, but what's really what we had problems with before is getting this nice seal so no bugs or anything comes in. So here we put a screen on the outside and this just simply folds in and locks in place and then it actually seals so that no wind comes in either. That's a huge, huge thing here in the desert. <laughs> and that, the, yeah, dust crafts. That's a huge plus in the desert. Yeah. So this would be considered your most finished dome then? I'd say so. I mean, it does need another coat of plaster because we did have quite a bit of cracking on this one. But um, yeah, this one has the most functioning windows and the best operating door. This is another design feature we're really learning is Square doors are nice, right? <laughs> they seal better, they're easier to make. Um, 
yeah, they overall just function better. Whereas our lancet arch domes, or doors on the other domes, those get trickier, they're very custom, it's hard to get that seal perfect, so we like, this is what we call a mine shaft opening. Um, it costs a little bit more in the building stage because there's a cement that goes across here, but in the end, for the finished work of the doors, this will just make your life a lot easier. <laughs> for more information on Super Adobe Earth Bag Building, check out mojavecenter.org. I hope you enjoyed returning to the Mojave Center with Ian and Nicolette and myself. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up, like on the video, share, and subscribe. Until next time, we all will see ya. See ya. Bye bye. <laughs>